the more that you can have interactions with people online and offline, I think that that is also going to continue to bring quality leads to your business. Business of Architecture, episode 424. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with interior designer, business coach, and marketing consultant, Pamela Durkin. So Pamela is based in Florida. She's been running her own practice for the last 30 years. And there's no surprise once you've been running your own business for that long that you've earned a number of hard won business lessons, which she goes into and starts sharing here today in this conversation. Pamela's real expertise is not only as an interior designer, but knowing how to become magnetic so that you attract those ideal business prospects and clients that you want for your business. So for Pam, design is powerful. And her real mission is to allow and empower designers to be able to step into that power. And after 30 years in business, she's now helping other designers create a business that they love through her in-demand designer program. She teaches them how to be magnetic and how to attract the best clients. She's recently published a book called Elevate, which can be found on Amazon, which goes into a lot of the details and structures and strategies that we discuss here today on the podcast. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Pamela Durkin. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Pamela, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I am amazing. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So you are an interior designer and also a coach, a business consultant, a marketing consultant. Um, you're based on the East Coast. You're down in, in Florida. Uh, you've got an extraordinary portfolio of work yourself. You've been running your own design practice. and you've you've also started helping other designers architects interior designers with their businesses with their marketing with their communications so how did how did that transition happen how did that relationship start to emerge for you well um first of all i'm still i call myself i'm in purgatory right now as they say (laughs) because i'm still you know doing interior design and i'm helping other designers and creatives, um, architects in this industry learn how to market better. So I'm sort of in the gray area, the transitional area of doing it all. So Mm -hmm. everyone that's wearing multiple hats, I feel your pain. Um, But I think what really precipitated this is about 10 years ago, I was, my business was starting to really start to take off and I was understanding, um, you know, I was getting better projects. And when you get that first really good project, you are like, your eyes are open, the veil is removed and you're just like, wow, this is amazing. Like this is, this is a whole nother level. And then I started thinking about, well, how can I recreate more of this? Right. And In doing that, I started becoming basically a student of marketing and started going to some groups and ended up in a mastermind group. And in that mastermind group, there was 40 other business owners in there, not one designer in the bunch. So they all had different backgrounds, uh, mostly men. And um, what we started doing is hot seats. So someone would get on, would get on at the front of the room and talk about an issue that they were having. And then the group would just collectively give their thoughts and their ideas. And I was finding myself at the microphone all the time because this is one of the things I love to do is I love to brainstorm and, and, you know, work with other really smart business owners and talk about problems and how to solve them. Yeah. So I was always at the microphone and somebody said, Hey, are you coaching? And I'm like, no, cause I'm a designer. And, um, it started to get the wheels turning a little bit and 
being in the business for 30 years, you kind of are always looking for the next thing. We're lifelong learners generally mm -hmm. in this industry and we always want to learn and grow. And I started asking myself, what's my next iteration? So here we are in the gray zone in purgatory love talking it. to you on this podcast. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. So what have been some of the constraints or challenges that you've you've experienced yourself with marketing a design practice or design firm and the challenges that you often see some of the people that you work with and coach with their communication with their communications and their marketing endeavors so one of the things that i universally see and i definitely see in myself and saw in what i was doing in my own business was I was being reactive. So I was sitting back and waiting for someone to contact me to tell me that they wanted to talk to me about a project. And it almost never occurred to me until I started learning that I needed to be more active in that approach. I needed to have a hand in who I was talking to and the opportunities that were coming my way. And so once I started really thinking about how can I actively curate opportunities, that started to make a big difference because I was making great relationships and opportunities were coming to my coming my way more frequently and they were better qualified. So that is one thing that I do see is that we just kind of expect the phone to ring or I've heard so many times, well, I gave my card to so-and-so, but I never heard anything. And I was like, well, yeah, but did you ever follow up? And they're like, no. So, so, so yeah. It, it really, really interesting because it sounds so deceptively Simple. obvious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we tend to, um, don't we like to overcomplicate things? I mean, I, I tell everyone all the time, let's not build a piano. Like we're just trying to make music. So, yeah. Got it. Great. And so, and knowing that we need to be proactive in actually looking for clients and finding work and, you know, obviously there's a great comfort in being reactive and lots of designers will kind of come from the, the dictum or the, or the cliche that, you know, good work will speak for itself. And all I've got to do is just focus on doing great work. And I mean, I've interviewed many people who, when I've asked, what's your secret to winning work? And they'll often say, just doing good work. Is that true? But you probably also have heard people say, which I hear, I'm the best kept secret in my industry. Absolutely. <laughs> which is you're doing great work, but nobody knows about it. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so how would you suggest that people begin to broadcast? What are some of the challenges that people have in, in moving from being reactive to proactive with their marketing endeavors? Well, we, a lot of us are introverted. So there's that, you know, personality trait that many of us have, um, as creatives, we tend to be, you know, have a bit of imposter syndrome or don't want to be boastful mm -hmm. about our work. We feel like that is not appropriate. Um, and the other thing that I see is nobody wants to be salesy. Like, you know, when you've got, you know, one wants to be pushy. I heard this yesterday. I don't want to be pushy. And I agree with all of that. I think that there's a way to approach it so that you're none of those things, but you're also showing your value. You're showing how you help people. I mean, the biggest thing that every designer and architect that I talk to wants to do is help people. Help people have a better environment, help people have a better quality of life, and they know they do that through their work. So if you think about what you're doing and talking about what you're doing, if that's getting that message to more people so that you can help make a difference mm -hmm. to more people, that in no way says, seems salesy or sleazy or anything. So the, the practices and design firms that you see that are really good at building a solid pipeline of consistent work and, 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 your, and, your, and yourself and your own practice, when you're doing it well, what does it look like? Well, you're getting, um, you're getting activity. I'm not going to, you're going to, you're getting leads, but you're also getting activity. So we don't want to confuse success with just qualified leads coming in because here's the other thing. I mean, qualified leads who are ready to buy now is what I should, which, how right. I should pray, phrase it, that you should be building your list 
and that you should be getting activity every week. And that could be in the form of opt-ins to your list, conversations, and of course, you know, potential projects because not everyone's ready to buy now. Mm-hmm. So I think the biggest thing that you can take away is consistency, consistency of message. Um, and that's really going to help move everything forward. I think what we tend to do in, in the smaller practices who say doesn't have a marketing team or someone that's helping them specifically with that, they, they get the job or jobs and they put their head down and do the jobs. They are, they're doing the designing and all the other things. And then they look up and go, oh crap, the job's over or the jobs are ending. Now I've got to start marketing again. And if you can figure out a way to keep that marketing consistent, then your business and your pipeline will also be consistent. Mm. So I I guess it's, it's, it's kind of, the elusive obvious if you like a little bit like losing weight where well you know eat 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 less calories or burn off more calories than you're consuming or the same thing with saving money you know don't spend more than you're earning the the advice is very simple but it's challenging it's not it's not easy um what what sorts of things do you find get in the way of either your your coaching clients or colleagues of actually executing and being consistent with marketing endeavors? Uh, So a couple things is we're wearing too many hats, meaning we're doing everything in our business and not handing any of that off or feeling that we can hand Mm. any of that off. Um, And also, um, you know, we want to be designers and architects. We don't want to be marketers because we love doing what we do. And I think that, you know, there's um, there's a gentleman I had heard about called Scott Houston, and he has a program called Piano in a Flash. And the thing that he discovered was when people want to learn how to play piano, they go to a piano teacher and they start with scales and they start with chords and all these other things. And he said, nobody that wants to learn to play the piano and not be a concert pianist wants to know all that crap. All they want to do is they're play their, they just want to play their favorite songs for their friends and maybe sing or have fun or create music. Just, you know, do that. And that's kind of how I feel about marketing for this industry. We don't really want to be professional marketers. We just want to be designers and architects who have a marketing portion of our business that brings us wonderful, fulfilling profitable work right Mm -hmm. we don't need to be the concert pianist we just want to learn to play our favorite songs so that's how i approach that marketing aspect of what i like to teach people brilliant and so how do we how do we start to learn to enjoy it is it is it best that we get somebody else to do it for us or is that out of the reach of many architects particularly when they're starting out or smaller firms what are some well you some, have are, to first of all you have to know like even if you hire somebody um, and you can you know have the ability to do that the first thing they're gonna ask you is who's your ideal client right um, and so you have to know what that is and I think that one of the best ways to do that is to look within your own business and start looking at the type of work you've done in the past that a you enjoyed B that was profitable. Um, see, you know, more work that you want to do. And so you can either do that, you know, you can do that with the numbers and then you can also start creating what I call that the, your client all-stars or your avatar, which is, you know, a combination of people and projects to create that sort of ideal next level work that mm-hmm. you want to get. You, you were mentioning earlier about having a, a list, if you like, of kind of potential suspects yes. and and yes. um could you tell us a little bit more about that list and how does how do we go about developing something like that and so you want to be creating or collecting email addresses for people that you can continually stay in touch with right and you can do that in a variety of ways i mean low tech is you could obviously you could do that all by hand you know 
start to create a spreadsheet in Excel with names and email addresses and stay in touch regularly with those people manually. Um, or you can start capturing those email addresses in a CRM where then you can, you know, keep in touch with them monthly or biweekly and you're sending, you know, sort of one note out to the whole group, which is, of course, can be personalized. And that is just such a great way to start building that, you know, what we call raving fans. So I can sit that list for me consists of clients, prospects, and then um, referral sources, because, you know, referrals are a great portion of everyone's business. I'm a big fan of using or putting my time into referral sources that can garner multiple quality referrals. Yeah. like vendor partners and, and other professional partners, as opposed to putting time into necessarily client referrals. Um, if your time is of, you know, the essence and, and, you know, you don't have that much time to do all the things, if you need to focus, that's where you should be focusing your time is how can I create these relationships that are going to bring me more and more referrals. So building the email list is super important because the other thing is we're relying on social media to bring us business. First of all, I think you should be looking at your social media to see if it indeed is bringing business for the amount of time that you're putting into it. And also, you know, the rules of engagement change on all the platforms in all the various ways. Again, so you want to get them. So I call social media sort of like the handshake that you would have in a network event. It's the very first step in the process, but then you want to get them off rented land <laughs> and on owned land, which is your email list. Because if all of that goes away, social media, for whatever reason, multiple yeah. reasons why, um, you still have that list. And that's a protected um, that's a protected asset for your business. Got it. So it's so we can be using social media as a kind of first as a first shop window, if you like, where we can be broadcasting project data, projects, images maybe content valuable content or advice columns or things or things of that nature that's starting to drive some kind of conversation with potential prospects or how do we how do we yes, how do we it, go it's from... like it's starting the conversation then it's strengthening a conversation because you know right. people do business with people a lot of creatives don't want to be on the camera in front of the you know in front of the picture um, they want to sort of be in the background and let their, like you said earlier, let their work speak for themselves. But honestly, mm -hmm. if you have a small business under 20 people, um, you know, people want to do, they want to know you. They want to know about you and your business and your philosophy. And especially in an industry, I believe that comes from a creative standpoint, they want, they think it's magical. What we do is magical. We don't think it's magical because we're, I mean, it's just us. It's, it's a culmination of our years of experience or our education or, or things that we've learned along the way. It's just, it's just us, right? Yeah. But I think people need to realize that what you do is magical and the outside world views it that way. So let's capitalize on that and start, you know, telling more stories. It's very interesting. Um, you know, many designers, architects are, you know, they, they'll, they'll get into the kind of portfolio mode of producing content. So lots of beautiful images of fantastic looking finished projects. And then we kind of get the Pinterest syndrome. Right. What, what, what's an interesting story that's outside of that? Should we be talking more about the behind the scenes and showing the messy process that goes behind creating projects as well? And, and, and how have you seen that or how would you advise that to be done well? Yeah, so I think you could even so for, first of all, I think we should be repurposing content more often than we are. We feel like we have to come up with one picture and then that's it. And then we can never use that ever again. But right. so a way to repurpose content is to use a picture that may be a picture of a completed project. Next time you crop it, next time you, you know, you add the before and after or things like that. So there's multiple ways that you can reuse content. But I think 
to me, something that's more memorable. I mean, think about anything that you've learned in school or something that someone has told you. You remember the details of a story more than you would by just reading about it or... So if you can craft a little bit of a story around even even just one element of that picture, I think that makes you more memorable. One of the easiest ways to do that is to, you know, as you go about your day, you're having conversations with clients and maybe with vendors about this particular project. Why not write those stories down and then recount them? Because it's a great way for potential clients or even potential vendor partners to see what it's like to work with you, to see yeah. that, you know, it doesn't all just magically happen. There's thousands of decisions. There's multiple conversations. There's the give and take. I mean, a lot, a lot of people think that designers and architects just sort of proclaim something and then it is. And so it is from a pie and... I think that the best architects and designers have real conversations with their clients saying, we can do it this way. I recommend it this way. Here's why. Here's the trade-off for doing it this way. These are the things to consider. This is why we can't do all the things that you want to do. And But I think this solution gets you to where you need to be. So all of that is more interesting and also is an educational process so that people understand so much better what that relationship's like and how important that is and why you need a professional to help you. Got it. So when we're looking at, we've got social media as kind of being the a first way of starting a conversation and then we, we're moving those kind of connections from, as you eloquently put it, from rented land into owned land yes. if you like where mm -hmm. you've actually got something you've got you've got their connection details or an email address then we need to kind of keep nurturing that relationship until they they're potentially ready to become Move a forward. client right and, and and what would that nurturing process look like how would we so there's a couple things one is well. um so you can either have something called a lead magnet which is a document that you would put together that people would opt into um, to get some more information. So if you have a client or many of your clients are asking the same questions, like even how do I evaluate a designer? How do I evaluate an architect? What, what should I be looking for? What information should I bring to an initial meeting so that we can you know, move that process along? Anything like that to give people information that's of value to them. And again, this would be conversations that you're continually having with, with clients or prospects. Um, that would be a great place to start with a checklist or a little, a little document to help them with that. I have, um, for my coaching clients, I have a book and that is um, a lead magnet that I provide. The other thing that I provide that is universal is I do a monthly newsletter. Right. And that, you know, I ask people to opt into that. You can only get that newsletter if you opt in um, and give me your email address. And that, again, just keeps those conversations going. Now, in the newsletters, there are call to actions, which I think is the other thing that we need to be, you know, we have to ask at some point. Hey, if you want for more, in, more information, click here, do this. This is your next step. And that's another thing that we're all afraid to do is to ask people to take that next step with us, and we should. Mm. Where does the role of networking play in all of this? So some of the old old-fashioned forms of marketing of you know going to events or maybe hosting your own events um, and, and kind of just making the one-to-one -one connections. How do you what, what would you suggest as an effective networking strategy that kind of uh, builds upon some of the marketing activities that your your firm would be doing alongside it. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I don't know that we're ever going to replace in-person networking mm -hmm. because it is such a effective method of making quick connections with people. So, you know, we say um, conversations lead to conversions. The more that you can have interactions with people online and offline, I think that that is also going to continue to bring quality leads to your business. One of the things that you can definitely do is 
So online, if you see somebody that's doing really interesting work, of course you can reach out to them and say, hey, you know, I really love what you're doing. I'd like to hear more and let's set up a call. I did that twice yesterday with somebody, um, two different people, and those calls got set up immediately. And so mm -hmm. that was really a good thing. And then in person, you just want to say to them, you know, you obviously want to, everyone likes to talk about themselves. So the easiest thing is to say, tell me about you, tell me about your business. And then a great conversation starter is, you know, I'm about around in town all the time. If I run into somebody that might be a good fit for you, I'd love to send them your way. Tell me who your sweet spot client is. And believe me, those people love to talk about what kind of what kind of aspirational work they're looking for too. And it just makes such a great impression. So I so like so online very, and offline marketing for sure. Networking. So that that's very interesting. Um you're kind of really approaching the relationship as like how can I serve, how can I help? Um and actually you know, you're thinking about being a connector and, yes. you know, how can I help you in, in your business? How can I help you grow and develop? And there's a kind of, uh, there's, there seems like a, there's a, there's a kind of giving first before trying to get anything. Yes. And it makes an impression. Like even, you know, I can tell by you just hearing that you're like, wow, that's, that's nice. I mean, when was the last time somebody said, let, you know, tell me about your business so that I can help you. You kind of feel really good about that. And it gives you a good feeling about that person too. So yeah. it moves that trust factor along much, much quicker. Love it. We mentioned earlier, well, ab about being introverted. And, and actually, you know, many designers are, by their nature, introverts, conversations, starting conversations, even sending an email out to someone they don't know might strike fear and like I just that I could so many other things I'd rather do than do that you know starting a conversation with a stranger at a networking event I couldn't think of anything else worse to do how do we how do we empower ourselves if we're if we're introverted to be loud introverts if you like yeah sorts of because it, it's really emotional and it's it is it's the million dollar question right yeah well, it was interesting. I was talking to a designer yesterday and she said, I met this, um, actually she had met an architect at a, at a event and she had just moved to a town and he was um, very well known. And he said to her, contact me after this meeting and you know, we'll set something up. And she said, great. And I said, okay, have you contacted him? She's like, no. <laughs> and I'm like, well, why not? And she's like, cause he's not going to want to hear from me. I'm like, he asked you to contact him. So here's the, you know, to your point, even when we're given permission, we're like, nope, yeah. don't want to do it. And then yeah. she goes, well, do you think he would want to do business with me? I'm new here. And all she started rattling off all these things. And I was sure. like, so you're asking me what I think someone else who's asked you to contact them is going to think about you. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, that's well, she's like, well, when you put it that way, that sounds really goofy, doesn't it? And I'm like, yes. So we kind of create all of these, oh, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't hear from mm -hmm. them. They don't like me or um, they must not want to work with me. So why don't they just tell me that? And all these things, like we kind of craft all these things that it's about us and what they don't like about us or that we're not qualified or they thought we were dumb or it's crazy mm -hmm. the things we, our minds come up to protect us from doing scary things. But yeah. to your point, if you wanted to reach out to someone that you don't know um, very well, first of all, I'd, I'd try to find a connection point. So if you've never met them before, I would find them like if they've been published or if they know somebody you know or something like that. Like I would start that conversation off, oh, I saw your really awesome article in XYZ Magazine or... I was talking to my vendor who did a project with you and your name came up. Like I would provide a connection point at the beginning of that conversation and then also go in, you know, explain why you're contacting them and say, hey, you know, I'd love to hear more about your business and, you know, let's see if we can connect. Mm -hmm. And so, but then you have to keep staying in touch. <laughs> That's the other thing. Yeah. It's not a one and done, right? Because relationships take time. Because as you know, you don't want to work with a new vendor unless you feel like 
they're qualified, like they're not going to leave you hanging, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you have to demonstrate so, uh, so, so again, very interesting that, you know, actually you can mitigate some of the sense or the fear of rejection by making the thing that you're offering harder to reject. Yeah. So let me, let me ask about you. Let me be able to give you value. Let me be able to ask, you know, have a conversation which is more you focused. So you're kind of, again, you're offering, you're offering value there. And then there is the, just the kind of discipline of keeping consistent with nurturing and watering the relationship, if you like. And again, I, I can imagine people, this is where a lot of people will end up slipping up, is they're like, oh, I don't want to bother them anymore. I've already spoken to them. Or, well, that's why you don't want to have the just checking in email. That's why you do a newsletter <laughs> or something like that, right? Um, but here's the other thing. Marketing is a numbers game. So we mm -hmm. also hang our hat as creatives. We hang our hat on if I get a call, I'm getting the job or I have to take the job, which is the other side of that, which I don't believe in either. Like I believe in control over your own work going, listen, if it's not a good fit, I'm not taking this job. So we have to realize that marketing is a numbers game and the percentages may be higher because we're getting a refer because a lot of our businesses buy referrals, but we're not getting everything. So you also have to realize too, like you may be contacting people and they might not respond because A, it could be for various reasons. It could be that they're busy. It could be that this is not of interest to them. It could be yeah. that, you know, there's a million reasons why it's not all about you, but you just have to realize that too, that, you know, it could be a no and that's okay because you've got, you can't hang your hat on one, right? You know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. what we do. We hang our hat on one or two instead of 10 or 20. What have been some of your proudest moments in your own business about how you've won clients or how you've won, how you've courted a project or sort of um, moments where perhaps you stepped outside of your own comfort zone and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and brought in a project either as a, as a, as a coach or as an interior designer? Yeah, so I use a technique in my own business called the shock and awe box. And this has helped me close, you know, six figure jobs. And that was something when I first used it, I was like, you know, we'll see if this works. See if this, I didn't come up with this technique. So I, again, got it from my marketing group. And, um, you know, I send that. So I do an initial call with someone. We kind of do a, a pre-interview. And then if we want to move forward, we set an on-site meeting. And before the on-site meeting, I send this shock and awe box. And in the box is, you know, a little bit about me. It gives a little gift and a note and all these other things. But it talks about like some FAQs and things about like boundaries of business and how to work with a designer and a couple things. And so what happens is it moves that process way along and then you've kind of trained this potential client on how you're willing to work, right? And I guess one of the biggest or the most satisfying things was, you know, the first time I got a six-figure job off of using the shock and awe box, I was like, damn, it works. <laughs> it works. And, um, you know, I had sent this box out and I said, you know, here's a present for you because it would be a gift to work with you. And, um, you know, just nobody's doing that stuff. I think the biggest thing in your business and we need to be standing I, I, out more right and this is how you do it i mean just just the idea of sending out something physical in this day and age sounds you know wacky yeah mail is not dead by it, the way if you think about it, 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 it suddenly what a love what a lovely thing to receive something physical or a handwritten note or a letter it's such a like novelty and yes and to your point it's a novelty and it's um you know, we're in a high touch business. And when we get in a project, mm. we're with someone, you know, for months or years at a time, right? And so how do you, um, how do you tell someone that working with you is going to be wonderful? It's going to be luxurious. It's going to be amazing. Aside from saying I'm amazing at what I do, which is what a lot of us, you know, kind of rely on. But sending this box ahead of time shows them. And it shows them before they've hired you. So you're giving them a peek into what it's going to be like to work with you and why you're different than everyone else. And that 
is powerful. Amazing. Um, when you're kind of at the very beginning phase, let's say you want to move into a new sector and perhaps you've got not very many connections into that new world. Say you want to move into retail design or, you know, sports stadium design or whatever, whatever it might be for your, your practice. How would you suggest that people start to just begin the map? Like where do, where do you where do you begin? Because I'll often hear conversations of like we'd really love to do this kind of work. Okay, great. How many people have you been speaking to? None. I, I don't even know. I don't, I know, I don't even know where Nothing. to start. Nothing. Yeah. Um, to be honest, um, LinkedIn I think is a very underutilized platform. We mm -hmm. tend to be on like to your point, Pinterest or Instagram or or maybe Facebook. LinkedIn is an excellent place to start. I would start investigating people in that field. And of course, it's going to give you related um, related contacts in that field as well. Mm -hmm. So I think researching that and then starting to do just to your point, the legwork of talking to people, having conversations, how, you know, even other firms, if you want, if you had a good relationship with them, you could call up and say, listen, we're looking to get into this. What are some of the pitfalls? What are the, some of the, the great things about it, right? I want to learn what it's like to start to get into this. You can't just like necessarily jump in because you, you don't even know, like, you know, when you were in school, what you learned in school and, and what it was like to run a practice is like, Light years difference, right? And so I think it's good to do a little bit of research and find out what you're getting yourself into. The other thing is, of course, um, professional organizations. That is a really excellent point of being able to either talk to other people in that industry or get education on that as well. So doing a little groundwork will really, will really help open some doors as to where you should be starting and, and how you should be approaching it. So, so kind of immersive experiences or events or conferences or conventions inside of a different industry or inside contact. of that sector yep. and, mm -hmm. yeah, and get contacts and then kind of, yep. and I guess it's this it's a similar sort of thing where you're now, you know, you're going in with the same mindset that you were talking about earlier, where you're kind of wanting to understand about you. Let me understand about this industry. So rather than it being a specific individual, you're kind of walking into a new industry and being like a sponge, if you like, right? trying to understand. And learning and then just what. making some great contacts. I think the, you know, it's the legwork part of mm. building. You're, you're essentially, you know, well, you're building a new vertical market for your business, right? So you're basically starting over in some, you know what I yep. mean, in some ways, because now you have no, um, you know, no history there, no leads there. And of course, the hardest job to get is the first one. Right. Because you don't have anything to say, well, I've done 10 of these or mm. I know these people or you can talk to these people. So you have to figure out a way that you can use your past projects and how they're applicable to this new sector and how it's really not that difference. I mean, as designers and architects, we know that, you know, every project goes through the same parts and pieces. It doesn't matter. I mean, yes, there's nuances of projects that are different, maybe educational to hospitality to residential, those nuances are different, but the, the steps are essentially the same, right? And so yeah. we just need to let people know that, you know, that's essentially the same. There's just a few nuances that we need to, to be educated on or how something app, you know, applies to this, this vertical as well. It's interesting when we consider, say, moving into a new sector and perhaps if it's something clear like hospitality or sports stadium design, okay, we could probably piece together like which conferences or conventions to go to right. or events. But something like residential, and particularly like high-end residential or luxury residential, we're suddenly faced with a problem of, my goodness, it's so broad of where high net worth individuals, I mean, even using the word high net worth individuals is, is kind of a, a bit weird in itself. Right. How, how, what would be useful strategies into, into luxury high end residential? Like where would we, where would be good places to begin? So that is, I mean, that's the demographic of the type of work that I do. And so one of the really interesting ways that you can approach that is I found that 
a lot of these individuals, instead of going to maybe the first logical thing would be, well, let me find out where those people are, like what groups market to those people. Um, mm -hmm. Think about what they, a lot of them have in common. They like to golf. They like to drink wine. Um, a lot of them are into yoga or cars, um, travel. So you could start being a part of groups like that where their interests are lying, where they're, where they're also mm -hmm. hanging out, right? And be the only designer or architect probably in the room, right? So there's an interesting yep. story where this marketing guy that I was following also had a hobby and he was, he did horse racing. And at the horse races, they would have vendors there. And you would think at the horse races, they would have vendors like, you know, for horse supplies and riding supplies and racing supplies, right? But he's like, in the corner was the jewelry guy. And he was like, this is weird. Like, why is there a jewelry guy at the horse races, yeah. right? And he said, the reason the jewelry guy was there was because when you went to these races, it was predominantly men. And when you went to these races, you could also buy horses, and it was an expensive sport as well. And so you could buy horses, and a lot of times people did. And two, they would be, of course, away from home for the weekends. And he's yeah. like, you know, when you had to go home and tell your wife that you just bought another horse, if you followed it up with a nice piece of jewelry, it kind of made the medicine go down a little easier. But think about it. Like, what a brilliant strategy that's so weird and wonderful that you're like, wow, he's the only guy in the room. He was he, like, everyone was, his booth was full because he was, they were flocking to him. So where can you be um, where you're, you know, kind of weird and wonderful in a spot where you're also in front of your ideal client? I love it. I love it. So it's really kind of getting in the mindset of the, of your target ideal prospect and, and client and starting to think and live a little bit like them and joining in the same activities and you know, you'll, you'll naturally start to create organic conversations. Yeah, and I think also, um, you know, I said at the beginning that we don't wanna be marketers, right? But we have mm -hmm. a creative mind and we are problem solvers by nature. So why can't we approach this part of our business the same way? Creative brainstorming, coming up with the charrette, like how are we gonna approach it? Like just like you would approach a project. How can we do this in a, in a cool way? How can we do this differently? How can we start to make this fun and profitable for our business? So I think we can tap into our creativity, our natural creativity, and come up with some brilliant marketing ideas that really garner some great results. I love it. Where, where does the role of PR fit into all of this for you? Is that, uh, is that an important arm of marketing that we need to be investing in and or is there a certain maturity that a business needs to to reach before we do that how does it no i mean i think visibility is always a part of your marketing plan i think that some people hang too much of the percentage of their marketing on visibility as opposed to sort of boots on the ground making connections because that's really what moves mm -hmm. the needle forward visibility yeah. is is being out there um, and being seen, but, you know, hand to hand marketing is where you're creating real connections. So yes, mm -hmm. there are some great ways to be visible. If you can start to identify some of the editors in your area and offer to be a resource for them. I have several editors now that just contact me directly and say, we're doing this thing. We'd love to have you involved. And then that's the other thing is timing. When they reach out to you, you get back to them as soon as possible. And I even had an editor say to me the other day, I wish everyone was like you. They like, he said, quick response, thoughtful answers, complete information. And so that is a way to be a trusted resource for, um, for any kind of news outlet. But, you know, definitely I would start with local. Um, if your business is geographically local, I would start with those local um, mm -hmm. media outlets because that's really important. And then there's some online services called HARO, H-A-R-O, which is help a reporter out where they will constantly be looking for um, comments from architects and designers and they will specifically ask for that. And so you can answer those and get put into 
websites and national, you know, some national publications as well. We were t talking briefly before we started recording about the mistakes that mortify you and how that, that actually when we go through that kind of learning process, these are often some of the best business assets that we can leverage. What have been, what sorts of mistakes do people, can people learn from, particularly in, in their marketing? So, they, so, so that they can also, you know, build up a resilience to the, the fear of rejection, if you like, um, knowing that actually a, a mistake can actually be a very profitable thing in the long run. What sorts of mistakes do you, maybe you've made yourself in the past or that you've seen clients make and, and then there's been a great learning from it? So for me, being in the business 30 years, the list is long. We probably could do a whole podcast on this. Um, but one that stands out is a few years ago, and it wasn't that, that long ago. I interviewed for a job, and there was, you know, when you hear something someone tells you in an interview, and you're like, oh, I don't know if this is going to work <laughs> out. And um they they started saying a few things and I'm like, okay, okay, but it was it was a nice job. It was a big job. Um, I knew I could get a really nice design fee on it. And I sort of went, yeah, it, how bad could it be? I'm thought, you know, this is my internal conversation. How bad could it be? So I took the job and regretted it from maybe the third weekend. And spent the next 12 months not sleeping well, dreading an email mm -hmm. from this person, wondering how the hell I'm going to get out of this job with that, with like, you know, mm -hmm. my everything intact, my business, my psyche, everything. And I think that what I learned from that was you have to turn down stuff that doesn't fit the profile that you have figured out because even if you do it out of, you know, it's a great job that, you know, money's great or I could really use, this would be the bump that I need or whatever, but there's still the red, the bells and the whistles and the flags are all going off. Yeah. I do want you to consider the fallout that happens when you have a client like that. So not only are you constantly trying to make them happy, um, which they never are, because that's just the way they are. Mm -hmm. You're also mm -hmm. sort of putting all your time and effort into them and that project, and you're ignoring the good work and the good clients that you have. And so, and then you're also not marketing because, of course, you're overbooked, right? Because you've taken this great, awful project on. Yeah. So think about the fallout for that, all that, and then the, the, the you know the mental taxing of good God, this is stressing me out to no end. So I think that was one of the biggest mistakes that I made was taking on a client that I knew wasn't really a good fit for me. Um, but I sort of let my ego of, Ooh, this is going to be, this will be a good one, get in the way. And, mm -hmm. um, so I would encourage you to, to think about maybe some things that people have said to you in the past or things that have happened that you're like, yes, we do not want to take on those projects anymore and write them down so that when you do a, your interview, you can, you know, start being mindful of those things and know, have a better idea of when you should turn things down. So, yes. Brilliant. Love it. I'm, I'm sure so many of our listeners will be able to identify with that, that feeling of, you know, you get the, the email or the text message and your heart suddenly just goes, I don't oh, even want to read it. No. <laughs> now what? You know, you're in another meeting and you see the phone go off and you're like, oh, yeah. now your brain is not, now f not focused on whatever it was you yeah. were doing. And, you know, as, as you say, it's the, the get taking on the wrong client because it's a long relationship. I mean, you, you were saying this, that's a 12 month relationship It's 12 months of you not being able to say yes to other right fitting clients that might have approached you or, or, or been in that um, position. So it's really wise um you know that we can slow things down you know there's no need to get married on the first date mm -hmm. type of thing um and, we, and actually be very selective yeah we don't do our best work so think about it that way too we're kind of just mm -hmm. trying to get through it right we're not 
applying ourselves to our highest creative level. Um, we're not, you know, problem solving. We're more like, let's just get through this thing and get it over with. And so that's not a good experience for anyone, really, right, in the end. And so, I mean, thinking about us doing our best work, you know, you've had those clients that were amazing. They were the nicest people that just really just, it was just a great relationship. And so if you can change the percentage and get more of those, it will be a much more fulfilling profession overall, right? Love it. Really sage advice there. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the, the conversation. If people want to get in touch with you and learn more about how they can improve their own marketing, what would be the best thing for them to do? So you can definitely go to my website, Pamela-Durkin.com, and under the coaching tab is my Marketing by Design newsletter that I send out every month. You're welcome to check that out. I have a book as well. And then you can find me on Instagram. I'm on there quite a bit. I'm also on LinkedIn as well. So you can look for me in those places. I love it. Brilliant. Pamela, thank you so much for sharing your business lessons and marketing expertise and experience. I'm sure that our listeners will find that enormously as, as valuable as I did. So thank, thank you very you so much. much. I love being here. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.